Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. You learn as a director that you are asked, your job is to answer questions almost every single Mm. minute of every single day. Someone has a question for you because they need your direction. They need to know what your vision is. And your job is to communicate that. Hello. Hello, listeners. How are you doing? The voice you just heard, listeners, is that of Janet Mock. You may know Janet as an activist, an advocate. She's very active in the trans community, uplifting and empowering and supporting those in the LGBT community. But you may also know her as a writer because she is a best-selling author. She wrote the memoir, Redefining Realness. And, um, She is such a perfect example of why I love talking to writers, as you will soon see. I'm going to keep today brief because we have to get to this spectacular interview where I asked Janet about all things having to do with screenwriting. Uh, Before that, it was journalism and memoir writing. She was given a kind of crash course in Hollywood, basically, by Ryan Murphy, who hired her to work on the show Pose, one of my favorite TV shows, which is about the life of a handful of trans women in 1980s New York City in the ball scene. If you haven't seen Pose, you must. Uh, But if you haven't seen Pose, this interview has plenty, plenty, plenty of advice and information and wisdom, both practical and, and ethereal for people who are maybe looking to get into screenwriting, maybe who are wondering what the role of a producer is Maybe you're wondering how uh, Janet Mock became the first trans woman of color to direct an episode of television and to direct an episode of television that won Billy Porter an Emmy Award. We're going to get to that in just a sec. We are also going to link to a fabulous Meet the Maker feature we had on Janet a while back. We've featured uh, plenty of talent from Pose on Backstage, including, you may or may not remember, listener, a fabulous interview with MJ Rodriguez, who plays the series lead Blanca on Pose. Go back and listen to that one after you've listed Janet. But um, also on Backstage.com, I'm looking at our homepage, Backstage.com slash magazine. We have a lot of great resources, uh, information, resources, articles, advice stuff centered around COVID-19 and around this ongoing pandemic crisis. Uh, We update articles about how the entertainment industry is dealing with the crisis, what actors, what artists need to know, what kind of educational programming is available online, what you can do to stay active and engaged and inspired. There really is a a wealth of knowledge at your fingertips at backstage.com. I highly encourage you to go check it out. But today we have to get to this Extra long, but extra juicy, uh, extra wonderful. Just really one of my favorite interviews we've done recently with Janet, uh, fellow Honolulu native, Janet Mock. (laughs) Mahalo nui loa for joining us, Janet. Uh, Let's take a quick break and get to it. This podcast is, of course, brought to you, listeners, by Backstage. Listen, aside from all the great inspiration and tips and all of that stuff we offer for free, like this amazing podcast, Backstage also gives you access to incredible casting calls all over the world. That is why it's the world's number one casting platform. If you're curious or if you're an actor yourself and you really want to jumpstart your career and you're ready to take the advice and the inspiration you've heard here in this very episode and use it, go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E. That's, again, 30 days completely free to try backstage where you can make a profile, upload a headshot, upload a reel, start browsing the casting notices, and start applying to jobs. Because who knows? Maybe one day, 
I'll be interviewing you. Again, that's backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code ENVELOPE. From journalism to memoir writing to screenwriting producing and directing Emmy-winning television, there's not much Janet Mock can't do. A trailblazing advocate in the transgender community, Janet became the first ever trans woman of color to write and direct an episode of a TV series, Ryan Murphy, Brad Falchuk, and Stephen Canal's FX drama, Pose. She now also produces the Netflix miniseries, Hollywood. Here's our chat with the legendary Janet Mock. Great. Um, <clears throat> hi, Janet. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. How are you these days? <laughs> such a loaded <laughs> question, right? Which used to I be know. like something we would just we would just like handle with such like brevity. Um, totally. Overall, I, I'm I'm good. You know, I am a very type A kind of organized person who likes okay. to know what's on the horizon, <laughs> and so this entire you know, um, social distancing, kind of self-quarantining um, yes. has been a um, a practice for me in patience, <laughs> in a dealing practice. with the unknown, yes. um, and of actually kind of sitting down creatively and like hunkering down on what is it that I want to do, what stories do I want to tell, what needs to be prioritized in this Ooh. in this moment of unknowing. Okay, cool. And for you, um, there I have so many different things to ask you, and I kind of don't know where to start. But for you, like you are, you have your fingers in so many pies. So when you say sit down to be to be creative, are you thinking about the, the television world, or are you thinking about your own writing, or like what kind of projects are those? Oh my God! Oh, so well, it's it's all over the place. So I think that what has been so interesting for me and my my whole journey, I guess, in this space of television and, and now film, mm -hmm. um, is I spent the last two and a half years on set. <laughs> Whether yeah. that means like going from a writer's room and going straight onto set, getting onto a plane to get to a set, being on <laughs> set for three weeks to like prep and shoot an episode, or, you know, being on set to supervise for for example, Pose season two, I supervise the entire production from start to finish mm -hmm. uh, for the second season. And so I haven't had much space, honestly, to really be creative without um, a deadline. And mm. that has been freeing right now to not have to be on set, to not have to supervise, to not have to sit down and have a lunch meeting with an actor to pitch them on a project or to get deeper about their character from my take mm -hmm. in the writer's room. And so to have that freedom now, um, I've been able to sit and, you know, really think about this novel that I had pitched a year ago to my agent, but never had time to actually sit down and do. So oh. I've been sitting with those characters. I've been also, um, you know, refining um, and doing research on a script for a Netflix um, feature that I will be directing and co-writing um, on Janet <laughs> Cook, this famous journalist that we had announced right before this quarantine, mm -hmm. um, before COVID-19. Um, and then also plotting out uh, two series ideas that I'm um, planning to pitch to, to, to Netflix for my first um, series development. Well, that is even more than I expected from you. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and really a novel on top of all of that a novel I've always wanted to write I, so coming from a space where I've written two books based on my experience yes. I've always want I've kind of get a got a little bit of freedom with Pose my first experience in Hollywood mm -hmm. to write from my experience but being freed by the fact that it's characters um, plot lines and stories are not necessarily my exact plot line and story and so to oh. be able to go into fiction a little bit rooted in the real life lived experience that i've had as a trans woman um mm -hmm. i love that freedom but at the same time i'm like oh what would it mean to be to think of a world that has nothing to do with my 
own stuff, but then I can still be, my stuff can still be imbued in a character. And I just mm-hmm. had this one tragic romantic heroine. And for some reason, I didn't think of it as a film. And so, and I didn't think of it as a series. And I was like, I think she could only kind of first need to live to be fully free in a novel, in on a the novel, page. in the, yeah, on the page. Cool. Yeah, and so like she keeps nagging me and I've tried to like fit her into other developments. Like, okay, girl, you know, (laughs) let's try to put you in part of this other ensemble of like, you know, uh, you know, um, kind of, you know, treacherous, soapy, melodramatic (laughs) housewives or something. And she was like, no, I don't want to be with them. I don't want to have to deal with these bitches. I want to be in my own world. I have my own narrative. I need to be centered and it needs to be small. It needs to be short and sweet. And this is what it should be. And so because of that, I'm like, okay, I guess I need to sit down and like write her out and give her time or I'm not going to be able to deal with all these other characters in my head. Wow. So she, yeah. she's fully one of the, those examples of like a, has a life of its own kind of an idea. Yeah. And very much writes her own self, but the <laughs> discipline it takes to like sit down yes. and do prose again has been hmm. hard for me in a space where it's like, Oh, sure. Um, in a space where I've been in like writer's rooms and there's three, at least three other voices there, you yeah. know, jumping in and putting, building upon my pitch or pitching an idea and then me building upon them. Like it's so collaborative. Whereas with memoir or novels it, in that kind of long form prose, you don't have that same kind of jumping off with other people. And so it forces you to sit with yourself and to really be like, okay, let's clear the space Let's figure out this and like really sit with a blank page without a whole beat sheet or an outline, but like let's sit there and figuring out what it is that this needs to be. Um, so facing the self, I guess, facing myself Ooh. has been a new, I, not a, it's been a revisiting of an old discipline that was very much second nature to me before sure. I came into television. And without the deadlines, like you're saying, which requires mm-hmm. it's, it's maybe more discipline. Oh, completely. And, and and no accountability, too, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no one's holding you to it. She lives exactly. in your head. <laughs> so, well, that's why I'm sitting here right now in my office with like five, you know, um, hefty bags full of like, you know, oh. spring cleaning clothing, because I'd rather do that procrastination exercise versus sit down and deal with that page. And so it's still the writer stuff Very is still going on despite the, the space. <laughs> yeah, so relatable. Totally. Um, you mentioned it's freeing. Is this like, we've heard on this podcast before, we, we, we've we spoken obviously to a lot of actors, we're backstage. So we've heard that it's almost a psychological, there's a psychological aspect of, um, there is a liberation in playing other people in like working in fiction. And as you who for the longest time worked in, I guess, for lack of a better term, nonfiction, is that part of this transition of like working in, working now with fictional characters means that you are discovering different things about yourself or able to say things that you wouldn't say as yourself? Spot on. Exactly. (laughs) Um, I remember the first time where I felt that sense of freedom um, with playing with fictional characters was Mm -hmm. writing some of the outrageous things that Dominique Jackson as Electra has to say. And the giddiness that I've gotten Mm -hmm. from seeing her say, for example, in a script that I wrote with Our Lady J for season two of Pose, episode nine, when the girls go to the beach and they have this restaurant scene and being able to collaborate with her and put all these different things that we've always wanted to say to cisgender women who are dismissive Mm -hmm. of trans women as being authentic or real women. And Mm -hmm. her saying that your whole identity is built on a a farce. Your whole identity is, is fake because it's all been built by your daddy who gave you a pony or your mom who gave you all the Barbies or your boyfriend who gave you, you know, for art said, you know, uh, boyfriend who made you basic, you know, and just like all of this stuff Mm. that I remember having the feeling of like, oh, I could never say those things because (laughs) I, as Janet Mock, would be heavily criticized for being so problematic. But, you know, Electra can be problematic. That's a part of her character. But she also is telling this, you know, unvarnished truth. And so in that way, um, I, I think it's kind of hard to go back to being like, I, Janet Mock is saying this, when you can be like, you know, oh, no, Electra said that. Or you can be like, oh, no, you know, our great heart and soul Blanca said that. You know, that wasn't right. me, despite my totally. name being on the script. Yeah. 
She's sort of like your scapegoat, uh, having a character <laughs> to say these things. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and even Dominique can say, oh, it's not me. I'm playing a character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I couldn't imagine, you know, well, I can't imagine, you know, my partner, um, he's also an actor and, you know, right now he's going actually a little mad, you know, he uh-huh. wants to be back on set. He wants to be working. He wants to be around people and collaborate and find those things together that you can only find in collaboration or in rehearsal or, you know, in a, in scene work with another partner. And so I think that I couldn't imagine being someone that was so dependent on other players, mm. right? To not be able to play with them in this time, not yeah. be able to discover um, and, you know, applaud each other. And so I feel it a little mm. bit as a director in the sense of, you know, after I've done my weeks of prep work, I get to go on set and finally discover with my actors and talk to them and collaborate and be challenged and challenge them. And, you know, I don't have that anymore, but I think right. of having that for the last two and a half years being on set it's kind of been a little bit of a breath to be able Mm -hmm. to like sit down and breathe and not have that pressure of a 12 hour day. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) um, Not having your line producer on your back saying, okay, this has to be your last setup. We have to move on, you know, Mm -hmm. to just be here and be like, oh, there's no needing to move on. And the days kind of blend into each other. And all you have Mm -hmm. is your own sense of accountability to say, These are the list of things I would like to accomplish today. Let's see how many of them I've gotten to. And that's not just the writing, right? That's the living. It's like, did I meal prep? Do I have enough stuff for my prime pickup delivery, (laughs) you know, of food? Um, Can I make sure I can show up for a neighbor in some way today? You know, we have a single woman who lives next door and we check in Mm. on her when we're about to run out. And so just all those little things that I check in with my mom via FaceTime. Did my nephew get Mm. a quick little shout out for me via text? Did... You know, so all these things are on the to-do list. And some days, you know, oftentimes the working out via Peloton falls off the list. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> and you're, you practice forgiveness and, and being kind to yourself. And <laughs> yeah. I try to. And I think that's where the binging of um, uh, reality TV at night, like 90 Day Fiance <laughs> um, or the Housewives <laughs> franchise comes in with like, you know, ordering from Sprinkles, cupcakes, or Magnolia. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Come in to self-soothe. <laughs> Honestly, that's really good to hear, too. I mean, frankly, maybe I'm speaking just for myself. It is helpful to hear that you are watch that Janet Mock is watching reality TV, because I am, too. <laughs> I don't want to be proud of it. But I think that this pod, these podcast interviews, you, you, you leaders of the industry are providing us with a model of how to navigate this completely unprecedented scenario. So any and all advice you have for this period (laughs) is welcome. Oh, I'm so glad. Well, the housewives (laughs) are literally a national treasure. I do not know anyone as brave as as (laughs) to put your life out there um, as unapologetically not Um, (sighs) self-aware. The enjoyment that I get from it, the research that I get from human interaction and group dynamics, actually, I think, to me at least, even though I'm watching it as an escape, to to kind of, in a way, turn off my brain and just be purely entertained, there is a part of it where you kind of, you can get how people talk with each other, how they don't communicate. Um, when they're thinking that they're communicating, that's so great. The the practice of of um, you know uh, passive aggressiveness that you could instill into characters based on these women. Oh my god! The the uh, non apology apology, the art of that. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the throwing yes. of a party planning just for a random, I'm getting a divorce, you know, or <laughs> I may it's have a baby, you know, what are the results of my paternity test? Who knows? You know, all of these things <laughs> are just, you know, just kind of great art for us to be able to glean yes. from. <laughs> yes. This is maybe, this is uh, such an annoying, like maybe name drop, but Laverne Cox was on this podcast. I know that you are friends with Laverne. Oh, yeah. And she said that she watches Housewives kind of for that reason, that it's an opportunity to psychologically get into a char- quote unquote character's head and that it definitely inspires her and helps her in her art. I am so glad that I'm not alone here. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> Yeah, well, Janet, it is so nice to have you here. This is the In the Envelope podcast. We are backstage. I know you've spoken with us before. We are huge fans of Pose. Um, And I want to, of course, ask you about, you described this idea of like, you've been on set for the last two years and you weren't before that. So of course, I want to ask you about kind of entering Hollywood. 
Um, but first, I, I just have to let you know, I am also from Honolulu, Hawaii. Oh my God, that's so random. Yes. It's so random. Come through Hawaii. <laughs> yes. And I would love to hear a little bit about your childhood, if you'd be willing to share. And what, you know, what, where, where were your roots in? What was the, did you have a career dream? Um, I know your path has kind of zigzagged a lot to get you to where you are today. Yeah, I think probably my first initial dream growing up, I think it was just like this, this need to want to be heard and recognized. I didn't exactly know mm. how I was going <laughs> to be heard or to be recognized for what okay. I could do when I didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but I think probably my first semblance of being recognized would be the whole teacher's pet thing. I could all, I, I always did well at like answering questions, being sharp, being quick, being of service to the classroom. And so that service nature of me kind of led me to run for student government and mm -hmm. kind of be seen and heard and recognized in that way as a leader, as a voice. Um, but I remember the first time that I felt it, I was at Kalakala Intermediate School which is a school mm -hmm. deep in the heart of Kalihi, which is only up the street, um, blanketed between my high school, which was Farrington High School, where I graduated from, okay. and my elementary school, Kalihi Kai, which is down the street. So they're literally on the strip. Um, and so I joined the newspaper um, staff. Um, okay. And we, had, we just had a newspaper out once a month. It was like this little leaflet thing ran by about six of us and one... Um, uh, uh, one faculty advisor who happened to be the typewriting, um, the keyboard class instructor. Um, and so oh. <laughs> I just remember writing, um, going out and reporting, you know, um, and mm -hmm. talking to my classmates. I think one of my first pieces was about, you know, should how often should we have pizza? Or, you know, right. like, is that the healthy, uh, the healthiest option for us? And something about st subsidized lunches or something, you know, something okay. heady like that. Um, and then that was, a, that was a segue into, I think I want to write for a living. And so that's why I eventually, you know, in high school, got into journalism on the yearbook staff and all that stuff. Cool. Um, of course, with the backdrop of my own melodrama of being a teenager, finding myself and mine being heightened by the fact that I also was a trans girl. Yes. Um, and so all that stuff, I think, fed into my needing and my wanting and my desiring to be to be heard hmm. um, and to tell stories eventually became the go-to for me, which pushed mm. me from the University of Hawaii, where I studied journalism mm -hmm. and fashion, thinking that I wanted to work at a women's magazine and be like, a, right. eventually an editor-in-chief. Um, and what led me to actually go to NYU for graduate school in journalism to get to New York City to work in said magazines. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, People Magazine. You've worked at, you've written for Marie Claire. You've written pretty much everywhere. Yeah, and so my yeah my first my first job was uh, People dot com, um, uh -huh. which back then they called digital journalism and websites quote unquote new media, and so they treated us as the bastard stepchildren, thinking like oh print is oh. king and we get everything and you guys oh are gosh. just like this ragtag group of digital randomness, you know? Wow. And eventually I was able to see the transition from, and I remember even feeling a sense of like, um, like I didn't quite make it because I worked in digital journalism in the wow. year 2006. Right. <laughs> and not realizing what a gift it was to be trained as a digital journalist in right. 2006, when I got to see by 2008, the whole paradigm shift yes. from digital actually getting all of the eyes and the attention and being the mm -hmm. thing that because of social media, people went to first before they even picked up a paper, a newspaper or a magazine. And so being mm -hmm. a part of that shift and, and change kind of had me be quicker on my feet. But I think what one of the things it did for me too was that, that pressure again of the deadline, uh, the deadline in a way where it yes. was like, it was hourly for digital. It was like, oh my God, mm -hmm. you couldn't even get your head. What is a feature? You couldn't even do a feature. Everything had to be quick little <laughs> bites of gotcha. gossip and fodder so that people would click more, right? Yeah. And I think that is what led me to actually become disillusioned 
um, with working in like a media empire and oh, made okay. me want to make the transition to writing my own story, going back mm. to long form and actually telling a, a very complicated story from start and finish. And the only way that I knew to do that was to start working on my first book, Redefining Realness. And that kind of mm. is what led me to that next chapter of my career from journalist to actually being the subject of my of my mm. own stories. Amazing, amazing. And I didn't realize that, that it was part of it was a disillusionment that then led you to this next chapter, which spread you out into a lot of different ways. It must have the book being such a success, it's such an amazing book, uh, must have introduced you to a lot of different people, including at some point someone in Hollywood or Ryan Murphy himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a it's, it was definitely the the disillusionment and the paired with the boredom and not being challenged. Okay, right? There's yeah. one thing when you're on a factory conveyor belt of sorts and you're just <laughs> constantly churning out uh, print, basically, just constantly churning out stories and, you know, things that are going to make people click and come to things but none of it necessarily having deep meaning. Um yeah. and so I think that that's what made me really turn inward and start telling a story of myself. Um, and with Redefining Realness, my path in life just completely shifted and changed. I was able to, number one, quit my day job and be mm. hired as a as a self-employed writer. I was able to then go and write stories about other people, longer form journalism, profiles, cover stories, interviewing mm -hmm. people, which I always loved which led to me having an interview series with mm -hmm. a digital series with MSNBC, which was another random kind of turn in my career yeah. in terms of my storytelling. Um, and then I wrote a second book. And that second book is actually the one as that was being released and I was doing the press tour on that in 2017. I think one of Ryan, someone in Ryan's camp both, bought both, actually Tanase Popa in Ryan's camp, who's a producer in his camp, read the book and told Ryan he needs to read my first book and Ryan was like, I want her to be in the writer's room of Pose. And so they requested a meeting with me in July, 2017. It was the most random thing. I was like, wait, what? I just finished wow. my a grueling book tour that had me on the road for two months, um, mm -hmm. going to little towns and, you know, bookstores and readings and, you know, college campuses and doing signings and all this stuff. And I was like, what am I gonna do next? Maybe I'll write a novel. You so, okay. and then I go back to that. And then I get this call um, from my agent saying that Ryan would like to meet with me on the set of the assassination of Gianni Versace, American okay. crime story, and he wanted to meet with me. And so I went there, I flew out to LA, I met with him. We had about maybe a 45 minute conversation in between setups while he was directing. Oh wow! And he pitched me the idea for Pose and what his ambitions were for it. And he said that they had had um, him and his co-creators, Brad Falchuk, a longtime collaborator of his, and Stephen Canals, a new voice mm -hmm. in Hollywood, um, whose original pilot script became the basis of what became Pose. Mm -hmm. And he said, we need, we need trans women's voices in this room. Um, and I think he had had a conversation or a few conversations with Our Lady J, who was writing on Transparent at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, I want you to join this room. Your voice would be valued. Um, come do this. It'll be fun. And I was hired on the spot. And within wow. three weeks, I had moved to L.A. and started. I rented a room from my two friends, Sam and Kyle, in the Hollywood Hills. And I was Ubering around the city to go back and forth <laughs> from my um, little rental to... Um, the Fox lot to write Pose is first season. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, that must have been, so were you, was there pressure? This is a completely different world. Is it the kind of thing where now looking back, you you didn't know how much you didn't know and that was helpful? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've always been someone, you know, my father taught me how to swim by throwing me in the pool. Yes. Okay. Um, no skills, no, no, um, <laughs> no method or mm -hmm. instruction beyond keep paddling. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of is always the way that I've kind of approached my my life experiences in a way. It's always been kind of head first, experience first, um, learning on the job to a certain extent. I think the difference, and I think I've mentioned it just a little bit earlier, is like the difference with TV writing and, you know, for my experience, memoir writing is, mm -hmm. you know, 
the fact that you're forced to be collaborative from the genesis of an idea. Uh -huh. And Ryan and his team of um, co-creators, Brad and Steven, had already been at work on what this world was going to be. And they wanted me and Our Lady J to come in and help specify that world gotcha. to really, specifically for me as the only trans woman of color, you know, in the writer's room and really as a producer um, and definitely as a director, um, they mm. needed my voice and my experiences uh, to help really shape what these women's lives were going to look like. You know, we had a, a great gift and challenge of having five trans women of color be cast as these characters, yeah. um, but we had to make them all different. You know, they were not a monolith, which is what I always knew. And so it was like, what different voices will we give them? What different perspectives on life and transition and love and sex and family will we, will we imbue into these characters? And so the great challenge for me was, number one was, the forced collaboration from the start, which is something I had never had to do before, right. which was challenging for me because it involves a lot of trust. In a writer's okay. room, you have to go into this space completely open. And I mean, everyone else in the room was very much open books and I was very much more closed. Do you think oh, okay. because I had written memoir and I've written about myself that I would be this open book? You know, literally my mm. work was an open book, but me as a person, I'm actually quite private and reserved. Okay. Um, I'm quite private, yeah, private and quiet and reserved. Then I come off in my prose. My prose, I'm, it enables me because I'm sitting with myself to tell myself my own story. But it's a whole other thing when you're sitting in a room and you're you're trying to come up with story and you have to pitch things rooted in your experience yes. um, and have people either applaud it and approve it or say, eh, that's not quite it. And so I right. think I was scared of that rejection a little bit of yes. not quite knowing how to pitch. And eventually I remember Ryan saying to me, he like held me back one day after releasing The Room. And he was just like, you know, what can I do to make sure that this is a more open, safe space for you? Uh -huh. And I was like, this is just new for me. I just don't. And he was like, well, we come up with the best ideas when we're all able to come and actually feel a sense of like safety, that whatever happens in this room does not leave this room or not discuss outside of this room. And he was like, if I can promise you that, will you promise to show up and be the voice that I know that you are? Mm. And so that kind of was really the budding of our, like, that's when I really felt like, oh, I'm being mentored in this space. I'm not just being thrown into this space and expected to right. just know everything instinctively. Instead, I was being shepherded. I was being supported. I was being encouraged mm -hmm. to do my job better, to show up to do my job. And I think that that was really the roots of my relationship with Ryan, which has led me to now go into direct and do all these other things. But mm -hmm. it really started there. And so for me, I think that I wouldn't have been able to, you know, people love to say, oh, she was the first trans woman of color to write and direct an episode of television, mm -hmm. the first to be hired in a writer's room in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that doesn't happen without that advocacy and that mentorship and that support. Sure. Because it's one thing to be the first, it's a whole nother thing to make sure that you keep that space open so that other people can come in, right? Can also be supported, can also thrive in that space. Because yeah. I could have been the first and been like, okay, bye girl, you know? Sure. <laughs> um, without yes. the support. So you need yeah. that other part of it, yeah. That's really beautiful, especially just this idea of in a writer's room or collaborating with other people, it's well, vulnerability is required or Yes, in this ideal, ideally a safe environment, it's encouraged because that's that's the good stuff, right? Like that's the good material mm -hmm. that's going to lend itself well to the story is you opening up and really voicing your own experience and your own thoughts. Exactly. Um, and it's also, you know, it's that, it's that great leap of faith. You know, I took a leap of yeah. faith to write about my own life experiences. I took a leap of faith by like, saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, put, you know, my own writing on pause in order to jump in and help develop and deepen this show. Um, and by taking that leap of faith and deciding to collaborate with these team of creatives and other writers, um, I was able to really learn. And if anything, my first you know, year on Pose, those first two seasons really were my graduate school. I was paid right. 
to learn on the job and to learn everything from, you know, um, creating story uh, beats to character beats mm-hmm. and arcs for them and how do they all talk and what does that flavor feel like and what does it look like to put that into a script and then going from, you know, a script to seeing Ryan Tone, you know, another director to say, okay. these are the things that I need you to have for this script, being able to listen and witness that. And then also to be toned eventually as my own director of my mm. own script and to learn from that side, I'm being toned from my showrunner who is Ryan and I'm yeah. learning. And then I get to go out and go on location scouts and I get to oh, do cool. director's prep and I get to do blocking and I get to talk to my DP and we can have a conversation and page turns about every scene and the shots that I want to set up and the feelings and the mood of the lighting and, Mm. you know, the spacing and the pacing of the camera moves. And I got to learn everything bit by bit by bit to the point of like, you know, it comes out a year later and it's on television. And for some fluke, you know, and great stroke of luck and genius, you know, that episode's heralded as, you know, one of the top episodes of the year in television. And it's my first time out. Um, And it was just a great learning experience, if anything. You know, I got to pay to learn on the job. Um, And it's been such a a gift. So I'm so glad I took that leap of faith. Is it a combination of, of being thrown into the deep end and throwing yourself into the deep end? Oh, completely. (laughs) (laughs) I think that it it is. And I think that that's where the mentorship comes in. You know, I had Mm. never before Ryan had a mentor. I never had someone who saw something in me and pushed me when I was ready to be pushed and go to the next level. So by surprise, you know, as I outlined, he came into my life, requested a meeting, hired me on the spot. He knew that he saw something in me, right? Mm. I go into the room, I'm a little reserved. And then again, he says, how can we create a space so that you can show up more fully? Mm -hmm. And then I show up more fully. And then it's like, okay, you've written this great script, episode six of the first season of Pose called Love is a Message. Now, Mm -hmm. after watching you be on set, watching you supervise production alongside me, watching you shadow me as a director, how about you start shadowing another director because I want you to direct the next episode, which you mm-hmm. wrote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so everything is kind of happening with support, right? And so, of course, I could have mm-hmm. said, Ryan, I don't want to do it. And he would have compl- probably pushed a little bit because Ryan never gives up. He would have pushed <laughs> a little bit, but he would have let he would have let it move on and find another director to do the script, right? But instead, right. it is that thing, like you said, it's, you know, I took the... I took the jump, I leapt, right? Like it doesn't happen without me saying, I believe that I do have the skills. I'm glad that someone else believes in me and they're gonna support me infrastructure wise to say that you need to shadow someone, you need to listen to this, you need to do this, read these books, watch these films, look at the Mm -hmm. dailies every single day and see how, how I set up, how I do my setups. Sit on set with Gwyneth Horder Payton and watch her direct. And Mm -hmm. when I say direct, we're not talking about when she's on set. We're talking about all the work, the prep work she has to do before she even gets on set with an actor. Meaning, what is she doing out in the world when she's scouting her locations? How Mm. is she blocking? How is she thinking? What is she communicating to a team of great collaborators, right? Your Mm -hmm. costume designers, your your production designer who's, who's building your sets, your you know, um, your props master, (laughs) you know, talking to them about what kind of things you think your actor is going to want in their hands, what's scripted, what aren't we thinking about that you may want to see in this scene. If we're saying that they're eating dinner, what kind of meal would they be eating at 11 o'clock at night? Did they make Mm. that meal? Did they not? Everything is so thoughtful. And so you learn as a director that you are asked, your job is to answer questions almost every single Hmm. minute of every single day. Someone has a question for you because they need your direction. They need to know what your vision is. And your job is to communicate that. And so having always been a very natural communicator, Mm -hmm. um, having been that teacher's pet, having been the one with the answers often, I think Ryan saw very early on that, oh, she is a natural leader. She's a natural communicator. And to come into this space, to be a director as an untraditional talent, a talent who had never directed before, never Mm -hmm. had eyes or set for directing, had not gone to film school, um, and also being a woman and a person of color and definitely a trans person, Mm -hmm. that I was not what 
Hollywood was thinking when they thought of a director. And totally. so in that sense, it took a leap on Ryan's, you know, side to say that he sees a vision for me, um, totally. that he knows that I can do it. And me being like, I think I can do it <laughs> and mm-hmm. I'm going to try to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, this is really terrific advice for anyone who finds themselves on a set for the first time, especially, I think, directing. You mentioned tone. Is the idea of like your tone as a director or your maybe style as a director, that is what emerges from doing all that work you're describing of the even working with the props and the location management. Is that from that, it does, does something emerge that is distinctly yours? Yeah, I think that's the great, um, the great, you know, power of collaboration is that, you know, you seek out directors, of course, as, as a showrunner, right? You, you want directors who are going to be paired, um, be properly paired with the script and the story you want to tell in that script. Each script is its own story, right? And it has its own feel, but the show in general has mm-hmm. its own themes and, th- and, and, and textures and lighting and tone that makes it what the show is. But mm-hmm. you pair it with a director who comes in with their own perspectives mm-hmm. and their own readings of the material. And so one of the first things a guest director does on a series is that they have to get toned by the showrunner. Mm -hmm. To say, when we were writing this, these are the beats and the things that were important. This is what we need out of this scene. This is the feeling that we want. Because eventually, in four episodes down the road, which is director does not have that epic four episodes down the road, they need to know that this is possibly coming up. So this is our first time seeing the start of this story for them. So if they're going to break, if they're going to say, for example, they're going to break up with their boyfriend in this episode or breakup's going to come later on. You have to say, we need to start showing tension in that relationship. It's no longer the fairy tale that it once was in episode two or three. Now Mm. in episode six, they're going to have this. And also in 10, it's going to end up being this. Mm. And so as a director, you have to have all of that stuff, that know-how, so that when you're you're on set with your actors, and this is happening usually 10 days, 10 to 14 days before you're on set with an actor for that actual scene, Mm. you have to be equipped with that knowledge from the showrunner, because likely the showrunner will not be on set. Gotcha. from your tone, meaning to be able to communicate that to the actor who oh. also won't have that four scripts down the road. And so it's a great choreography mm-hmm. in directing. And it's sometimes it's harder for guest directors because they just pop in for one episode, not knowing really where the series is going and what's going on and what the writer's room is thinking. Right. Whereas for me, as someone who's in the writer's room, when I came on for episode six, I had written that script with Ryan in mm-hmm. season one. Um, I had written two other scripts before that episode. Um, I had been on set from the first day of the pilot all the way through, um, me having to direct my own episode. And so in that sense, I was very much um, a native of Poe's world. So I didn't really need a tone meeting. Um, If anything, Ryan was communicating to me certain things or certain things he wanted emphasized within the script or what was Mm -hmm. important for this. And so for me as a director, It's for me, you know, my episode was a lot of, that episode was a lot of Billy Porter, um, um, pray tell, um, and Kate Mara's character, um, Patty, who was married Mm -hmm. to Evan Peters' character, Stan, in season one. And so it was about the two of them and these confrontations that they were going to be going through. One being for Patty and her whole journey into what her husband is doing with this affairs with the sex worker who she then mm-hmm. discovers is trans. And then Pratel, of course, is dealing with, you know, his own mortality and the fact that his beloved Casas, his boyfriend, is dying of AIDS. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in that sense, I knew all the things that I wanted to feel and do in perspective and the shots that I wanted to have. But I also had to show up for a showrunner and make sure that I was doing what what he wanted for this script. Number one, his name is on it. Number two, he's the showrunner. Um, and so at the end of the day, I'm in service of the the showrunner and the show. And so every guest director has to go through that that process in a way. Amazing. This is all super, super informative because everything oh, you're describing, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's super um, unique to TV. Like this is not true of a film, certainly, and it's not true of of theater or commercial work or anything like that. Like this is long form storytelling that does not necessarily have an end in sight. And it has to be churned out on set week after week. It's fascinating to hear about all of those different roles. I have to ask about another role that you have, Mm -hmm. being a producer. Is, Is being a producer a different hat? 
Is it a completely different set of skills? How do you think about that role? Um, yeah, everything for me always comes out of the the role of writer, right? So my writer mm-hmm. producer is very much linked for me, and I think directing is as well. But I think the producer pieces, you know, I'm on set and say for season two of Pose, I was on set from the very first shot all the way until the last shot because I had directed the the finale um, mm-hmm. in in my heels. Is the name of that script, Pose. Mm-hmm. Uh, season two, episode 10. And, you know, I had watched every day of production and my name isn't on the script for every script. So in some days I was just there to make sure that I was of service to Mm. the director that's on set. So I'd be there, you know, say Tina Mabry was one of our directors. Uh, Gwyneth Horder Payton was one of our directors. They directed both seasons, um, directed episodes for both seasons of Pose. And I was just there to be of service for them. If they had questions about tone or something that they must have missed, or do you think we got it? Or, you know, I could be right upstairs or I could be right on set sitting next to them, depending on the Mm -hmm. importance. Every scene is important, but (laughs) depending on the complicated nature of a scene or what they needed for that day. And I'm also not thinking about the episode that's being um, shot. There's also the episode that's being edited you know, that just oh, right. finished. There's yeah. an episode that is coming down the pipeline that's being prepped by a director at that time. So I will also be with the director as they're prepping their mm-hmm. ne- episode that's coming up next. And then I'd also be um, thinking forward. I might head is also, and my body is also in the writer's room. So most times with mm-hmm. season two of Pose, because I was on set, and the writer's room is in LA where Ryan lives and resides with all his other shows. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. um, I'm on call for the writer's room while also writing on set and in my office. So the producer wow. role for me is linked with all of those things. It's what gotcha. has just been shot, what is about to be shot, what is being shot right now, and what are we still writing to finish up the season? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where the producer <laughs> role comes in. And in large, you know, the producer role is a lot of, you know, what are some big ambitious ideas that we think we can do in the writer's room that we want to do in the writer's room and what's actually doable, right? Which for right now in the world of where we're at now with thinking about what does production look like later on, we're thinking about the ambitious nature of the scripts that we always break and write for Pose and what can we actually get done and what can we shoot first and what are actors' availabilities and what are our now, we have to, rethink about the slate of directors. Will they even be available to do the work when we, whenever we are able to come back up? And can we do our big ball scenes again? Like, can we put 200 and something mm. people on a set in a room mm. uh, in the Bronx? Like, we don't know if we can do that again. So what do our ball scenes look like? Wow. You know, these are questions that we're still having and that largely comes off as a, as a producer. Um, you have to think sure. about how do you fix the problem? Um, And then as a director, how do you communicate a vision? Mm -hmm. And as a writer, it's like, what is the vision and what is the story? And so for me, those are the three different kind of hats that I have to juggle. But it helps when you are able to do it all. (laughs) So I was able to do that all with Pose. And I was able to do that all. Yeah. And I was able to do that all with, with Hollywood as well. With Hollywood as well. Yeah. And I wanted to ask too, is there another component here of, uh, we love hearing about casting. Have you been involved in casting? Yeah, so in my, um, with Pose, um, I did a lot of the guest actors. The principals, okay. Ryan and his co-creators, they found the, f- the first round of mm-hmm. um, series regulars. So the five women, um, Angelica, India, MJ, Dominique, and Haley, as well as, you know, all the other characters were already set before we started the pilot. Mm -hmm. I then, you know, as we went into production and there's all these guest roles that come on and recurring characters that show up Mm -hmm. that then I had a handle with Steven. He he and I would sit and we do casting sessions just through what Alexis Fogel, our casting director, would send us tapes of people who came in to read or people who were self-taping. And so we would just watch all the tapes, you know, give our feedback on who are our favorites. We watch tapes based on the smaller pool that we liked, send Alexa back sometimes. Like, I think that we may not have found the person for this, but please Mm -hmm. save these two actors to read again because we think we have other roles that could work for them. So in that sense, we're always in conversation throughout the season about casting. So I'm constantly casting 
um, throughout the the season. And so you're yeah. looking at a lot of actors' tapes. You're looking at a lot of self tapes. Um, you're having conversations for bigger roles that attract bigger stars. They often do not mm. read, but you'll see their mm. reels and you see what their flavors are. You already would know who they are. So you'd yeah. cast them already through being a writer. You'd be like, we're writing this role for, you know, um, specifically for Patti Lapone. Like we know she's going to play. <laughs> we know we want her to play an antagonist and we know that we want MJ to have an antagonist for the entire season. <laughs> so you're already, you're writing that for Patti Lapone. There's no casting cool. in that. It's just Ryan as a producer going to her and saying, we'd like to do something with you. How, how would you like to play with us on pose? <laughs> you know, how would you and like then you to like play that. with us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, then it's like, you know, you loved working with us and we had me and Janet had this new show that we're going to work on. Would you like to be with us on Hollywood? And then yeah. she comes off and then all of a sudden she's a Ryan Murphy player, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I think that that's just like the natural kind of cool. um, casting process. You love someone so much, you write something for them, you know, they're a guest actor in one thing. And then all of a sudden, like Cecilia Gentelli, she plays Ms. Orlando. She came back for both mm. of our seasons. She had a uh-huh. small arc in episode four of season one that I had written and we cast her just based on Alexa doing a call out to trans Latina actresses. She mm-hmm. read it and she was so wonky and strange. And we were like, oh my God, she killed it. And we saw the cut of it. And then we were like, okay, we need to bring Miss Orlando back in season two. And then we came more. up with a whole story. <laughs> exactly. Very and she cool. came back again. Um, and so that's how it kind of works with television, um, yeah. at least with the casting process. You're constantly doing that throughout the season. That's fabulous. I mean, listeners of this podcast, yeah, are delighted to hear any anything along those lines of like, Maybe you're not right for that particular role, but if they like your tape or they like your reel, you will be kept in mind for future roles. And then, of course, it is always possible to be cast on a show and to be to be given more material. If you really hit it out of the park and they really like collaborating with you, you're going to have more opportunities, especially it sounds like with this level of collaboration and like being open to ideas. Oh, completely. And it's like, who's the most ready? Who's ready to put a sense of play into, you know, one thing I'm always looking at when I'm looking at a tape, especially because, you know, we don't have time anymore. And now definitely in this world, I cannot overemphasize the power of the self tape. (laughs) Make sure you have a mic. Make sure you have a ring light. Mm -hmm. These are small investments in your career, Um, especially now that you're going to be doing it so much more because, you know, the fact that our bodies can't be in rooms together as much anymore. And so you have to communicate that sense of play. I would not even waste, don't even waste the moment of your slate. Can you make us laugh? Can you have a Mm -hmm. bit of joy in it? Do you look like you're good to work with and that you're Mm -hmm. easy and you want to be here? Um, those kind of things. Did you make choices that were completely not on the page? Did you read the subtext and give me things as a writer that I didn't even think that I wanted for this little small character who now I want to be a bigger character because of the qualities and the sense of play and the 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 greatness that you brought to it, the originality. And mm. so for me as a director and a writer, I love actors. And so mm. when I can see an actor who is on a tape and they look like they love acting <laughs> and they also have a joy with my words and even though certain things may not make sense that they can take that leap and figure out what the backstory is despite not having the backstory. Right. You know, that's the stuff I'm always looking for. And even though they may not be the right look or the right mm. type or the right feel, meaning like the age, the look, the skin tone, the, mm. you know, the feeling of being like their authentic 80s New York. It may not work for this piece, but maybe it could yeah. work for a cop that comes down the line later on who's going to have an arc or a lawyer for someone or, yeah. you know, some casting director for a dancing thing or a choreographer. We're always looking for those things. And so we, I always note to Alexa, I'm like, be- I love these three actors. Please mm-hmm. call them back for something else that feels more in line with what they give and what they do. Fabulous. That is so, so cool to hear, especially like, I mean, I was going to ask, like, especially in this time of of Corona, it's terrific advice to really focus on the skills that are required in creating a great self tape or great demo reel. You mentioned um, the the lighting and microphone. I mean, what else can actors do these days? I love this tip about like (laughs) convey that you have a joy for for acting and for for playing with the words. That's a fantastic tip. Yeah, because one of my favorite I remember seeing um, 
um, a tape, uh, it's so random, on, on Hollywood um, for the first season. Where it, it was a small role. Her name was Josephine. Mm-hmm. And she just had one line. And I mean, it's just one line. And, you know, when it's one line and the actors come in to read that one line, <laughs> you know, or to self-tape the one line, it's like, it's so hard. And I, I already come with it with a lot of empathy. And I'm rooting for each one of them to do amazing. And a yeah. one-liner is hard hard because you don't have you can't work up a monologue to get there you don't know what the moment is exactly you don't know exactly what the writer is going to want for it but i'm watching and i'm watching a series of young women after young women deliver this is literally the line i think it was like (laughs) hello ace pictures what she's coming here and that's all she does like and in the midst (laughs) of it that's all she has to say there's three little beats it's like super hard it's normal right it's like Hi, this is Ace Pictures, just like Monday. And then next is like, what? You're surprised. And then it's like, she's coming here? You know, (laughs) so it's just so strange. And Mm -hmm. and it's weird, but there were like five actresses read for this and there was one and her name is Colette McDermott. And she Uh read it. And the, the disappointment that I felt from like the three out of the five I was like, oh my God, no one's getting it. We're never going to find this role. It shoots next week. How are we going to find, oh God. And then Colette comes on and she does it. And you're just like, oh my God, I'm obsessed. I'm in love with you. And then what we did was wrote the Josephine character into like three other episodes in the season because of her one line reading. And it's like, not, you know, it's a bit part. It was just, she's just outside of, you know, Joe Mantello's office. Like that's her role. Mm -hmm. But in this, she's introduced in this piece. And when she does it, we wrote more for her and I gave her more ad libs and I made our main character, um, Jack kiss her because I just loved her so much. And so I was like, I can give her more, let's do her more. And then she happened to be, which is Hollywood. She happened to be Dylan McDermott's daughter, but I had no idea until oh. I saw a close-up of her. And I was like, Colette looks like Dylan. And then I was like, Dylan McDermott. And then I looked to my script supervisor, Tracy Merkel. And I was like, Tracy <laughs> is, and he's like, I think that that's his daughter. We Googled and it was his firstborn child. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> that's classic. It's a classic Hollywood. It's a small world, really. No, and I told, and I remember telling her, I went up to her and I said, I want you to know you got this role, not because your father is a series regular on the show and a longtime yes. collaborator of Ryan, but because you were the best, re- your tape was the best tape out of all Amazing. the tapes that we read through, that I went With through. With one line, yeah. With one line. Literally six words, I think. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really, it's very inspiring for people who are submitting their self-tapes right now. <laughs> but I can't tell you, the, the microphone and the lighting too. The, yeah. the microphone and the lighting. The ring light, they cost maybe like $45. And, yeah. a, and just to get a little microphone that plugs into your iPhone while you're taping yourself on a tripod, mm. you know, it's little investments. And I That's think that now that we're yeah. even going more into self-tape because mm-hmm. of the lack of wanting to expose people to one another's bodies and stuff, yeah. um, that I think that to make those two investments, not two, but it's a ring light, it's a tripod, and it's a microphone. Okay. At the at the at the bare minimum, yeah. Yeah, great. That's so. That's such great advice. And I wanted to ask too. I want to. I gotta let you go. But what else can we be doing in this time? I know you support a lot of causes. Um, not to put you on the spot, but mm-hmm. is there something we can do? Are there causes that you suggest we donate to, or you know, what can we do while sheltering in place? I think one thing is to, you know, if you are. Uh, capable and able-bodied. Um, one thing that we try to practice here in in our is being good neighbors, right? I think being yeah, that like you said, yeah, like we live neighbor. in an apartment. We live in yeah. an apartment, and we know that there. are Luckily, I have a partner, right? And we're both healthy, and we're both young, um, mm. and so we actually took the took um, took. Uh, the we follow the leadership of another couple in the building who actually wrote in the elevator, they wrote a note and it's so beautiful mm. and says, hi, we're Kyle and Jason. Um, we're neighbors in apartment 203. Um, if there's anybody who can't get out to pick up medications, who can't get out to get food, we run out often for our own stuff. We're more than happy to do it for you. Here's our phone number. Mm. Practicing what it means to be a neighbor, to be a community, 
that that could just happen in your building, that you don't have to go and do grand things, but there are elderly people in your building and there are single people in your building. There are people who are sick too in your building who don't have family living nearby, whose family can't be exposed to them or to to travel. And so thinking about ways that you could actually advocate for others and show up for the people around you Mm. and to extend that beyond your own loved ones and beyond your own um, family, right? Mm. And so that's one thing I, I would say, start where you live, start there. Mm-hmm. And then I think the that's next thing is if you have, if you have the funds and the money, um, I'd say donate, donate to causes that are delivering foods to the most vulnerable. Um, yeah. You know, thinking about Meals on Wheels, thinking about um, Feeding America, donate mm-hmm. your money to make sure your own local food banks, making sure that you're donating canned goods or whatever they need, supplies. Maybe they need bodies there to help package those things up. Mm-hmm. Look that up, look up the local stuff first. Gotcha. Um, I'd say to, to give to that. And then the third thing is always to be a voice. Um, if you have a platform, and all of us do now with Facebook, we have th- th- tens of thousands of connections based on the impressions at which we, th- we we share our thoughts out to the world. And so it's mm-hmm. amplifying the causes that are close to you. Definitely the elderly, because they're the most hit um, and yeah. they're the most often forgotten. Um, thinking about how do you get food and medical care and, and, and shelter to them. Homeless folk, LGBTQ youth who are homeless at this yeah. time. Giving to True Colors Fund is a great place. Giving to homeless uh, shelters that take them in, like the Ali Forney Center. Mm-hmm. Um, SAGE is a great um, um, organization that gives resources directly to LGBT elderly folk mm-hmm. who in their generation were not having kids and don't have families in that same way. So who's looking out for them? We have to look out for them. And so mm-hmm. I think it's just really digging and thinking about who's the most vulnerable and how can I help by starting from where I'm at. That's kind of been the challenge to myself in this time period. Mm-hmm. So maybe that'll be helpful to others. Yeah, it absolutely is. Thank you so much. Gosh, this is so terrific, Janet. Thank you. <laughs> this is just of course. An interview of pure advice gold, truly. Um, can I ask you just two quick backstage questions? Because we are, we are backstage and I feel obligated to ask you. Um, first of all, do you have a performance uh, off the top of your head? What is one performance that every actor, writer, director should see? and why oh my goodness wow um oh god i'm like speechless but i think the one that i got to stand witness to from beginning to end meaning from writing it on the page to seeing it be shot as a director to watching it in the editing room and still still never failing to cry when i watched it in front of an audience is the duet that Billy Porter as Pray Tell <laughs> and MJ Rodriguez as Blanca yes. did when they sang Home from the Wiz. Yes. Watching them deliver that in their own separate takes and coverage, watching them do that together, many different sizes. Mm. I cried more than I have ever cried on anything in my life, from anything that personally happened to me. <laughs> and I've oh, had a wow. lot of sh- it happened to me, but the cathartic experience that I felt, and they were lip syncing in this, right? They were singing to tracks that oh they had already had, had laid of and course, they did yeah. it pitch perfect every single time with such heart and emotion. Um, I'll, I'll always be forever changed because of that. And so if anyone wants to choose one scene from Pose, and we're not a musical, mm-hmm. but to watch one scene from yeah. Pose, it, it would be that um, AIDS cabaret scene yeah. when they sing that duet together, when Blanca starts it off as a solo and she yeah. almost can't get through and she nearly quits because she sees a young trans woman like herself who is dying of AIDS, who's deteriorating, mm-hmm. and she can't get through the song and her best friend and beloved friend and brother, pray tell, gets up from his spot sitting next to his beloved who is dying of AIDS mm-hmm. and goes to support her and say, I'm going to pick up right now, but you're going to finish this song with me. And mm-hmm. when they get through that, that moment and the lyrics and the way it's shot, I, you know, give myself kudos as a director. Absolutely. Every time I watch it, I, I cry. I can't help but to yeah. cry. Um, and it sets the tone for what the show really is. Um, and it's about love. 
It's about family. It's about being deeply rooted in a shared lived experience that was hard, specifically 1980s New York City and what happened to LGBTQ folk because of the AIDS epidemic um, and how they pulled through and are able to create the most beautiful music in the most sorrowful of times. Mm -hmm. To me, that's that's the performance um, that I would share. Yeah. I mean, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. It's that's really, and you must have then you saw that from the very beginning, writing the episode to filming the episode, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to Billy Porter winning an Emmy. <laughs> Is that I just know. The, I mean, that's just a cherry on top, right? <laughs> well, it's something we always talk about. You know, he wrote an op-ed in in Variety, which was so sweet. But he said he wouldn't have gotten his Emmy without me. And no. to hear that from from Billy, when I know that he would have gotten it, because Billy's just talented, but the <laughs> fact that he acknowledged me as the writer of the episode, as the director who was there with him for every single take, who worked yeah. with him through stuff, to give, to give homage to the creatives behind the scenes who often people don't see because the actors are who we see. Um, that's another great piece of advice, to shower acclaim and love to those... <laughs> to your collaborators. And I'm always yes. speaking the names of my production designers, of the costume designers, of the hair and makeup people, of the, you know, the, th- the hundreds of extras that come on set and breathe life into every frame. You know, yeah. none of this happens alone. It's not a singular focused talent kind of thing. Working in film and television is about, and I'm sure also on stage is about collaboration. You do none of this alone. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Um, okay, last question. And you've you've basically written books about this topic, but if you, I ask everyone, if you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice, what would that be? Slow down, enjoy the mm. process, um, be present exactly where you're at right now, because you'll never get this moment back again. Um, and yes, girl, you are correct and you are right. <laughs> Trust that instinct and keep mm. pushing forward. Yeah, that's what I would say. And it's not, not really right. one piece of advice, but I think that as a trans person, and I'm sure a lot of queer people can understand this too, or people yeah. of color or women or anyone that's often silenced and invisibilized, um, is that so often you're met with people shaking their head mm. and what you need is someone nodding at you. Yes. Um, and that simple affirmation can push you through. Um, and so sometimes you have to nod at yourself and say, yes, You got this. Trust your instincts. You're right. That feeling that you have about this person, about this moment, about this opportunity, trust that. Do not silence that. Do Mm. not silence yourself in the same way that the world is constantly, oftentimes, Mm. silencing you. Yeah. Well, your work is proof that that you can nod at yourself. And it's it's really, really inspiring. And I I really thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and for giving us like above and beyond the wisdom that I knew you could provide. (laughs) Oh my God, thank you so much for having me, for spending this time with me in this moment of unknownness. Um, But hopefully in our unknowing, we get to connect even deeper with ourselves and and of course the the people around us and that Mm. it makes us grateful of the times when we're able to go out into the world and create with other people. Um, And that when we do that, we get to do that safely and be equipped yes. to be able to fully show up together. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for equipping us. Oh, thank you. In the envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope. <laughs>